Shanti and good afternoon or good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, so today we're having session two of our topic, The Power of Thought. So, okay, so uh, one of the questions that came up is about dreams. So how are we to treat dreams so that they don't recur? Baba has told us that dreams are very often matter from the day before, which are still sitting uh, unresolved in the uh, mind and come up in dreams. But otherwise, dreams are really something that gives you an access to material that's in your subconscious and which needs to be um, addressed. And so if you have a recurring dream, it means you're not addressing it and it really needs to be addressed. So stopping it from recurring is not a good idea. Uh, some dreams are premonition. And um, so there is that. Dreams are um, many things, and they are symbolic. I don't think they're really to do with superstition, um, but they are very much to do with a very deep part of yourself. Um, Sometimes they're prophetic, where you can dream of something that then happens later on. And this um, is so that you're prepared when the thing comes and you're not uh, taken by surprise. I, I don't think we have to treat dreams any way in particular, but I do think... Um, that if you have a lot of dreams and you have an active dream life, you would be interested in them. Um, they are a form of communication between your conscious self and a deeper part of yourself. And if you are a soul with many, many births, then there's a great deal going on in the deep parts of yourself. So that's what I would say about dreams. Another question is, we have been talking about vices being emotions that are triggered when the ego gets hurt. Yeah. So what about the viceless and egoless stages, particularly the viceless one? Can we think about it as being free from the influence of any kind of strong emotion? Well, the thing is this, um, there's a huge spectrum of feelings all the way from completely unrealistic imaginary feelings to something very, very deep and subtle and refined. Um, the different words that are used for the five vices, greed, anger, lust, attachment, and ego, have their own spectrum. And um, one way to describe them is negative emotions. Negative in the sense that if you feel angry, then you will act Accordingly, you may shout, you may start throwing things around, you may um, have uh, passive aggressive, you know, the, there's this whole set of things. And um, if you call it a vice, it um, presumes that you uh, are responsible or having an emotion and it doesn't have any other source than that you are bad, you see. That's not true at all. Uh, there are a lot of things that are the sources of this. And so when you start um, 
thinking about vices in a Victorian manner, your understanding of the human psyche is pretty limited and um, punitive. That's how it is. And so very many BKs think of, um, okay, you can accuse somebody of having a vice and that means you're telling that person they're bad, you're giving them a put down, you are doing all sorts of things which are themselves very vice-based and you think that you're being really good. So what I'm saying is that um, we need to understand these things in a much more refined manner than we have been uh, because we do not belong to the early 1900s <laughs> and um, so we have to really rethink uh, what Baba means by viceless, egoless, bodyless, which is anyway a translation into English, which is already English of the 19th century. And people really don't use that language anymore. So that the way people interpret it is in a kind of rather old fashioned religious sort of a way. Um, and because of that, it tends to hold you back spiritually rather than carry you forward. And um, bottom line is we want to move forward. And if there is something which is holding us back, then do we want to keep it or not, you know? And so some people might want to keep it, but in my opinion, it's better not to keep something that holds you back because it's counterproductive. So calling it a negative emotion, um, what it means is that if you are having a negative experience which is prompting you to perform a negative karma which you would later regret then um, there's another way to handle it and so you use gyan in such a way that any negative emotion that may arise within you you have choice and you decide what you're going to do about it, how you're going to do about it, and you're being proactive, not reactive. You're being, um, I would say, more meaningful about how you're processing your feelings, and you're definitely not going to do the dance of shame and guilt and all of that stuff that really went out with two centuries ago. Uh, and and you're um, coming to a point of neutrality. You know, this material that we're studying is called the knowledge of the Gita. And it's very well known in the Gita that you need to be um, in a position of neutrality and equilibrium vis-a-vis um, positive and negative, because one who is spiritually balanced is neither pulled by something that's too nice or too nasty. You, you are in, in um, equal place, and you are uh, becoming independent of the pairs of opposites. And all these vices are also described in the Gita, and all of this material comes from the beginning of the Iron Age, because the Gita was altered substantially at that time, which is also the time when all this moralistic religion uh, became uh, uh, articulated. And it's exactly the same thing in Christianity and Judaism and Hinduism in Buddhism and in um, Islam is all practically word for word the same thing. And that was the mentality of the people in the Iron Age who thought that any kind of bad thing that's going on is because the soul is bad and it has to be punished. And so this is quite different from what Shibaba is talking to us about. 
and and he's saying that you do have karmic accounts and your karmic accounts can be triggered by time and they will um, take the form of an energy or an emotion which deceives you into doing an action that you would rather not do if you were in your balanced state. And these then are called vices. So I prefer to get away from all of that moralistic, religious, punitive mentality and try to get a little bit closer to dealing with karmic accounts and asserting your um, self-regard in how you conduct yourself. And that's why I'm talking about these things in this way. And, and some people may not be comfortable with that. You can't do anything about that. Uh, so her question actually is, if we change the definition of anger, last greed, from vice to emotions. Does this make the explanation of how Raja Yoga enables us to go into transformation any clearer or valued for that matter? What it does is it gives you more control, more power um, within yourself and in your circumstances. And I think it takes you out of the um, I would say the mentality of a religious cult or sect, which is that way. Um, and I don't think that it's useful for us to set ourselves up uh, in that way uh, because it goes bad very quickly. And it means that people in position of authority can abuse their power really easily. And it, um, it just takes us away from anything called what I consider spirituality. And uh, it, it treats people like naughty children in kindergarten who have to be wrapped over the knuckles. And this is absolutely not what Raj Yoga is about. So uh, even the word purification, you see, people assume that it means you have to become good from bad. And all of the connotations that these words acquire are in that context of this punitive mentality. And, and I really don't see that Shri Baba is talking to us about that at all. Purification means that any contamination that is in the soul, because the soul has taken sorrow, will have to emerge, and it emerges in the form of a dark emotion. And what you have to do as a practitioner of Raj Yoga is open yourself up uh, for this dark energy to come out of you, which is a purging. Mm -hmm. And without reacting to it, um, enduring the discomfort of it, and, um, you know, transformation doesn't mean that you become something other than what you are. This word parivartan mm -hmm. Uh, really means that you're returning to your original condition um, before anything happened. And, and BKs don't really give enough attention, in my opinion, to the fact that it's a huge problem that people take sorrow. And when people are getting punished and corrected and belittled and that stuff, they're taking sorrow and, and the setup, the religious moralistic setup is designed to make people uh, take as much sorrow as possible, which is the opposite of what Shiv Baba is saying. He doesn't um, encourage people to punish each other. 
he encourages people to understand that these are scenes in the drama and they should be neutral about it and it's not their business to um you know be school teachers with each other you know we are um experienced adults and if you act like a, a kind of violent school environment and then you back in the 19th century and um, that's not what this is about <clears throat> thank you um so more and more what i am personally getting is there are many things sister denise that can be unsettling when we hear you and the churning you're providing us. Uh, but it's also for me, the message is don't get settled and be comfortable with what you've heard because you are in Gyan. You're supposed to be knowledgeful. And if you are wanting to become a master and a sovereign over yourself, uh, you harness, polish, refine, or even the Gyan so that you become wiser. <laughs> Uh, that's for me what I'm getting because uh, the other questions uh, are still in the in the position I think personally of oh, but this is what I learned in Gyan and uh, how do I now um, situate what I know from Gyan or at least what I've understood with the new information that uh, Sister Denise is providing. So if I read just one of those questions. So when Baba says donate the vices, it is usually in reference to an eclipse. Understanding the eclipse as a soul being weak, as opposed to your 16 celestial degrees full. So the question is, does donate the vices mean that when those emotions come because the soul is weak, it is best not to take action and let the emotion move and live. Uh, actually, I think that uh, that person who's asking that question has received information that's really not quite right. And, um, and I think this is because in my experience, there are vast numbers of BKs who don't really understand Gyan. And this is something Daddy Jenki uh, used to mention quite a lot um, because it's the way it is. There's very, very little um, refined teaching of Gyan going on. And... Uh, and this is why everything is kind of sliding back to a conventional religious way of looking at it because, you know, most of the people who are teaching it don't know that there's any difference between the two. And so this is why I'm doing this work because, um, because to, to not know these things um, is, is to not claim your rights. And you do have right to know. So um, I'm not giving new information at all, but I do look at the Murleys very closely in the original, the Sakar Murleys and the Aviat Murleys. And I had... Um, nearly 50 years of a lot of discussion with the original yogis, the, those who came at the beginning of the Yagya. And they were not under the influence of conventional religion in the way that people are now, because Baba had worked with them intensively to extract them from that. Um, the whole point of Shri Baba coming to earth is to clarify that the way the religions have understood things is incorrect from a theological point of view and from a psychological point of view 
and from a sociological point of view. And so he gives a lot of information to clarify it, but most people just don't pick it up. And um, and uh, people who become Raj Yoga teachers, uh, some have very intensive training, but that's a tiny minority. Most people take the seven-day course and start teaching without having processed their own stuff, uh, without really understanding the knowledge deeply, without really knowing what yoga is. And um, this is how, how it goes which is okay, but it could be more refined. And my aim is to work with those who want to really understand what Baba's talking about at a deep level. You see, you mentioned this word sovereignty over the self. Even that is misleading because we don't have sovereignty over the self. We are sovereigns, the self you see, and it's uh, uh, taking you back to the idea, which is very clearly stated in Christianity, uh, um, that you are born a sinner. You are, by definition, a bad person, and the religious authorities are going to correct you. And Baba says, that's not a good place to start from because it's um, totally untrue. But what is the case is that, and, and I go back to this expression, taking sorrow, uh, and he, he mentioned this very much, you know, don't give sorrow, don't take sorrow. So people pretty much understand about not giving sorrow, but even the word sorrow is misleading. I would change that to harm because sorrow is very subjective and harm is quite objective. And if you make a subjective word as an objective reality, it means you don't understand English, don't understand language, and, um, and you get everything very mixed up. And so I try to bring it to what Sheep Baba is actually saying. And so if you have taken sorrow, that means somebody did some negative karma to you or they harmed you, put it that way, and you took that unpleasant experience deep into your soul as compared with remained a detached observer and didn't take it in. So when you take it in, it contaminates you. And, and people don't get that, that, that taking hard uh, experience from your parents, your teachers, your religious authorities, your friends, your enemies, whatever, you take that in as a personal um, bad experience that is negative karma to take it in because this contaminates you. And Shi Baba is teaching us not to do that because we already contaminated enough without getting any more. And so our, our um, knowledge of the drama is specifically to teach us that if somebody is behaving in a disgraceful manner towards you, so what? And your strength is you don't take it in, you don't take it personally, you don't take it on. And even if they do something very harmful to you, you handle it, you see. But you don't allow it to make you feel bad about yourself because it has no meaning and you do not give it any meaning, you see. Because otherwise, there's going to be a reaction to that and you are going to give as good as you got. And that is what makes you do a negative karma. And because when you take that in, this is what generates all the emotion, the resentment, the hatred, the feeling of vindictiveness and so on. 
this is what love is uh, warning us against because this contaminates the soul and people don't get it. And I, I'm trying to enable people to comprehend this because if you don't comprehend it, you cannot really uh, use the knowledge of Raj Yoga productively and you cannot really arrive at freedom. Is that what I'm saying? Thank you for that clarification. We will need to... For me, it's a con, con, continuous learning. Um, so I think at this point, Sister Denise, um, we can go back to the material because there's a lot more that have to be reviewed and clarified. The part that I um, reached uh, yesterday uh, was just... Um, the part beginning to interpret Raj Yoga in a religious or moral way is to remain in the body conscious part of the confluence age. I think most people think that the confluence age is the soul conscious part and the iron age is the body conscious part. But um, we do think of ourselves as Brahmins, so we are in the confluence age, but still you are switching between soul consciousness and body consciousness. And if you are body conscious, but um, using language to yourself and to others to say that you're in the confluence age, then you're still body conscious. And so that's why I'm saying that in the confluence age, you can have a body conscious part of it and a soul conscious part of it because you know this whole work that Baba is doing for us is to get us to become soul conscious from body conscious and that is not an easy thing because the default state of being is body conscious even if you have all the words that Baba has given you you can still be body conscious and that shows in the vibration, the action, um, how you respond to shocks and unexpected behaviors of others, and just the fact of taking sorrow, um, which a lot of people do. And um, it's quite difficult for a person to handle these sudden and unexpected scenes in drama which are directed at you in a harmful way for you to flex with it and be um, neutral, stay in your self-respect and so on. And this is because this is constant testing and you are all the time in war, a spiritual war, and the main people who will destabilize you are other Brahmins, because they know very well how to de destabilize each other. And it's a very competitive uh, setup here. And that's as it should be. Um, but the thing is, when people respond to it in the religious way or in the moralistic way, then they start complaining about each other, which means they haven't understood anything. So we're trying to understand these things, all of us. So I say that confluence age is a period of time when two forms of consciousness are superimposed one on the other. Sometimes soul conscious dominates, but mostly body consciousness is the dominant sense of self. And perceptions are interpreted according to religious and moral perspectives. So this to me is the challenge it's like you you go into this default uh knee-jerk reaction to people's behavior uh, which is uh, moralistic and which is bhakti uh, not gyan so then it carries on it takes only one second to switch from one to the other however it requires much strength and clarity to remain in the soul conscious position. 
I don't know if you remember this, but Baba has said the first lesson is be soul conscious. And the last lesson is also be soul conscious. So that means your entire life in the confluence age as a BK, as a Brahmin, is all about trying to figure out what does it mean to be soul conscious? And how can I actually be soul conscious all the time in the middle of all sorts of things that trigger body conscious reactions? So that's the job. That's the work, that's the study. So then it says, this is because of the problem of ego. So when people say ego is a vice, then um, they're not going to work with it. They're just going to try and um, hide it or stomp it down or whatever. But ego is a flip-flop between superiority and inferiority complexes in some people's description. But um, people who are in a lot of this inferiority mentality, there is ego, just as much as the superiority one is. And neither of them is the real you. So the idea is to try to grasp what is the real you. And this is something that you can do when you draw power from Baba, because that enables you to make contact with the real you and experience it so you know what it feels like to be the real you. And most of the time, you're not in that, but you know what it is. And so all the work is to try to be in that. Um, and sometimes it may be difficult. Um, so I say, I think it's not useful to consider the five vices as vices. In India, there is much attraction to onomatopoeia. So onomatopoeia is a word that means you say something that sounds like what it means. But what happens in um, another part of language is you translate a word into some other language with a word that sounds like the word that you're translating. It's a kind of onomatopoeia. And in France, where I'm currently living, uh, there's a lot of attention on language. And there is something called the Académie Française, which um, oversees the French language and how it's used. And they talk about false friends. And false friends are exactly this. You, you take a word in one language, and then there's another word that is rather similar in another language, but it has a completely different meaning. But you translate using that word because it sounds like the one you're working with. And so just because it sounds like the right thing doesn't mean it is the right thing. So vicar and vices are pretty similar sounding and the spelling is pretty similar. So immediately people say, okay, that's vices. And, um, and it's been going on like that since before any official translations happened. So words get translated according to this principle and there, as a result, the translation is faulty, sometimes entirely incorrect and misleading. But that's drama. Drama is like that. So why I say drama is like that is because it's okay. It doesn't matter that it's like that. What matters is that you get it and that you make the necessary adjustment in your mind when you hear that word. So I say the Hindi word is vikar. And it just so happens that vikar is the beginning of the word vikarma. Um, because you, all you have to do is put an M and an A on the end of it and it becomes vikarma. So in English, vice means sexual malpractice. So ego is not sexual malpractice. Greed is not sexual malpractice. You know, lust in 
particular instances is sexual malpractice, human trafficking is sexual malpractice, grooming little girls is sexual malpractice. Uh, and um, being attracted, physically attracted to someone is usually an emotional thing. And in uh, many cases, it's a physical thing, but most of the time, it's because of an emotional emptiness. And that's not a vice. That is a lack of spiritual power combined with life experience where you did not receive love. And um, so that's not a sin, that's a wound. So when you start looking at everybody's wounds as sins and punish them, you know, imagine going to hospital and all the doctors are taking chainsaws to the people and cutting them up, saying that your disease has to be punished. <laughs> that's not going to go very well, is it? But you're doing that with people when you... Um, look at the things that they're struggling with as something to be punished. And that really belongs to a Victorian mentality, which was absolutely common at the time when Brahma Baba was living. And that's how everybody was thinking. And you know how we have... Um, the stories about this group called the Taliban and how they are uh, behaving, especially towards women and uh, everything about women is bad. Well, this is identical with the social attitudes in the place where Brahma Baba lived, which is the same place as where the Taliban lived. And, and this is how they thought and felt. And so naturally it's going to come in to the way that BKs um, look at behavior modification. But, you know, this is a hundred years ago and, um, and people don't really think that way anymore uh, because there's so much information that has arisen about what happens inside the soul who has experienced uh, emotional trauma, social trauma, sexual abuse, uh, all sorts of things, which is a vast number of people, many of which are in spiritual practice because they want to heal from that. And so uh, going back to the Victorian era when you really should know better doesn't make any sense to me. And um, I don't think it would make any sense to Sheep Baba either. So then you have to see. I think I would like to make an analogy with um, science. You see, in the 1920s was also when science really took off. And, um, you know, in the 1830s, you had the Industrial Revolution in Europe, so people started mechanizing agriculture and developing industries and so on. And um, when I first came in Gyan, which was the mid-1970s, uh, there was nothing like video. There was nothing like a cell phone. Uh, the recordings could be made on quarter-inch magnetic tape, and Baba used the Grundig uh, tape recorders on quarter-inch magnetic tape to record Murleys in the 60s. Um, but you see, technology has advanced enormously. We now have Wi-Fi, Internet, Bluetooth, um, satellites, uh, space travel, I mean, all sorts of things which were not there at all uh, at the time of the 1920s. And the knowledge about 
the psyche, about the working of the soul, um, has moved forward and forward and forward in a similar way. And if BKs want to stick with um, um, mechanical things, when they could be at a much more refined level, that's up to them. But you can't really impose it on other people who know better because they won't buy it, you see. And um, Baba has actually said everything that you need in order to grasp a very refined, you can say, technology of consciousness. Um, but if you don't do it, then that's up to you, but you could. And if it is being done and you don't, you know, if you're still using a quarter inch tape when all the other people in the room are on um, of their uh, cell phone and Wi-Fi communication, then they will look at you as some sort of dinosaur, which is okay if you want to be a dinosaur. But what I'm basically saying is that there's nothing to prevent us from going to the refinement, uh, because when you have the refinement, you are going to be able to do yoga better much more effectively you're going to be able to work through your stuff much better and more effectively and you are going to go to the top of the class most probably and uh, if you want to stay behind that's up to you but um, other people won't be so interested you see so the thing with religion is that it got put together about a thousand years ago formalized and people like to keep it that way and there's a few modernized forms of religion but a lot of people are very traditional and they think that if they keep with the old ways that's better and so that's your choice so i'm just simply offering uh what i think is the way that baba is um wanting us to go, but then it's up to you if you want to do that or not. Um, I go further to talk about the Gita, because Baba says all the time, this is the knowledge of the Gita. So, okay. So the Gita talks about sense perception as deceptive. And um, when he gives you knowledge, he also talks to you about the third eye. So the third eye is um, perception, which is not sense perception. The third eye is also called the eye of knowledge. So when you know that someone is a soul, you can activate your third eye in the sense of your intellect and mind's ability to see not the physical face but the soul who is the real person behind the face which is a mask you see and then that changes how you look at people but um, if you don't do that and then you just evaluate people on the basis of the sound of their voice and the color of their skin and the hairstyle they have and the color of their clothes, then you will be deceived. And there are vast amounts of VKs who function like that, all the while thinking that they're being very soul conscious, but displaying all the signs that they are judging people on the basis of uh, sense perception and not on the basis of something much more refined where you're actually able to capture who that soul is, what that soul is. So now a sense perception goes directly to the mind, which is a subtle organ of perception, an interface between the five senses and the soul. Now many BKs, they keep on saying that the soul is the mind, intellect and sanskaras because somebody told them that. But Baba keeps on saying, that's not what I'm saying. He keeps on saying the soul has mind, intellect, and sanskaras, and that these are subtle organs of the soul. 
And people interpret that, that, okay, the body is made up of lots of organs, and so the soul is also made up of lots of organs. But still, Baba says the soul has, it, he never says the soul is mind, intellect, and samskaras. So that means you have to think, okay, then what's the soul? And that's a difficult question to answer because it's very, very subtle. And uh, practically outside the range of comprehension of the vast majority of people who study this information, but it's not completely out of range for everybody. Uh, so you have to chun. He keeps on saying chun. You think, okay, I'm a soul, I have a mind. Sometimes he says, your mind is your creation. I have an intellect. What is an intellect? It's a calculating machine. And it's a machine which can store information. So it's a little bit like a computer. The mind is not like a computer. Then you have sanskaras. So sanskaras, usually people say, okay, your sanskaras are... Uh, the consequences of your karma. It means you are responsible for your sanskaras. That's a very simple way of looking at it and very incomplete. Um, because you also have a predestined heart in your soul. And whether that's your responsibility or not is something to think about. Because you came with your heart. And um, other soul has a different part. And uh, this is very, very deep and tricky to think about. So a lot of people don't think about it because it's too difficult. But it can be thought about. You see, what's the difference between my sense garas and my role? And um, what is my predestined part? And who am I? This is a deep, deep question. Who am I? What am I is easy enough. I'm a soul. Who am I is much deeper. And who you are influences how you receive what comes to you through your sense perception. And if you are disconnected from yourself, then your sense perceptions will hit those parts of yourself that are formed by your life experience and your karmic accounts, which means they never really get to you, the self. And so Baba teaches us to neutralize the um, things that life has done to us so that you can receive the input from life as a soul rather than as a, a set of um, life experiences, which may or may not be your responsibility. So this is deep stuff. And we can't really expect everybody to be interested in it like this, but it is there. So then the Gita and so many moral people talk about pain and pleasure. So the scientific people also were, maybe not so much now, but they used to, you know, if it's pleasurable, it's good. If it's painful, it's bad. Well, not necessarily. Um, and so people are attracted to pleasure and they are... Um, unattracted by pain and um, then you hear of some kind of pain which is good and some kind of pleasure which is bad and so your sense of good and bad cannot be linked very easily to the pleasure pain principle but there are masses of people in this world who, who just operate like that you don't have to now, your senses have a practical function. You need to know it's cold, it's hot, it's wet, it's dry, uh, food is uh, fresh or not fresh, or um, 
you know, all, all the things that the senses tell you about the environment, which enable you to function in a very practical way. So, but Raja was not about that because you already know how to function in a practical way. Raja yoga is about things that you don't know. And they're very subtle and they're very deep. Raja yoga makes it possible for you to understand yourself that there's never been any time when you didn't exist as an individual. And that's deep, but that's what it's about. And to come into your power, to become the master of, not yourself, but to become the master in the context of life. This is what Raj Yoga is about. And that's all about knowing um, the philosophy of karma and understanding subtle details about consciousness, you see. Um, maybe I should just go a little bit further about ego because um, a lot of people talk about ego in terms of sense perception, right? Uh, it, it causes people to believe uh, because there being attraction and re repulsion of the physical body. So people get deceived into believing that if they get possession of something or someone physically attractive, it enhances their value as a person. And they really believe this. And this is why we have something called the advertising industry, which gets you to buy stuff that you don't need because uh, you think that it'll make you more attractive to someone else who may love you because ultimately the problem is people are spiritually depleted and one of the ways it um, expresses itself is that you desire to be loved if you desire to be loved that desire may be sexual attraction because really you desire to be loved or that may be greed, you want things because then you will be loved. Or it may be anger because if you get angry with somebody, you can browbeat them into loving you. So it comes that. And if you are using ego as a vice, then you will um, do all kinds of dances to get people to love you because they will be impressed by you and you will be charming and this and that and the other. And in that way, you can actually be a predator and feed off another person's energy, all of which because you are spiritually depleted. And that is the problem. Vices are secondary. The primary problem is you're spiritually depleted. And this is why Baba says, uh, if you be soul conscious, then you can get onto the same level as Baba. And then you be uh, in remembrance of Baba because then you can absorb spiritual energy into yourself, which means you will be spiritually filled which is otherwise known as 16 celestial degrees complete. It's about light. So the full moon, we just had a full moon last night, the wolf moon, very bright moon, because of the light of the sun being reflected off the moon. So you need to take light and energy from Shiv Baba. And when you do that, you're automatically, without having to make any effort, automatically pure peaceful, powerful, loveful, blissful being of light. So the, the work is not to fight against any vices and give them up and all that stuff, which is the religious way of dealing with the problem, which doesn't work, never has, never will. But she Baba says, don't bother with that, it doesn't work. Take light, take energy from me, and you will be in your power, you will be back to your original condition, which is pure. And yet there is this contamination from negative karma. So all that has to be purged out. And what the yoga does is cause that corrupted um, 
alloy in the soul to come to the surface, which means it goes from the subconscious to the conscious. Then it disturbs you like anything, but you have to let it go. And then it's not there anymore. And Baba explains this every day very clearly. But still, people don't get it. So ego is this, what I call as a reaction to stress. Ego is, is something that you do to protect yourself against all of the harm that you perceive is coming to you. And one description of ego that Baba gives is you feel insulted. So uh, if somebody says something unkind to you or about you, you will have a reaction. And the reaction is not because you're a bad person. The reaction is because you can't handle the pain. And why you can't handle the pain is because you're spiritually depleted. So when you feel yourself spiritually and people insult you or do whatever they do, you don't take it in, you see, and so it doesn't do any damage. So this is why I say ego is a reaction to stress, and um, that means it's not punishable. You know, when you call something a vice, it means you're justified in doing violence to that person but you're not, you don't have that right. So this is why I say administering punishment does nothing except intensify stress. It causes trauma in young children and consequently the religious moral angle on life is, I call it the worst possible and because it leads to an oppressed, constricted, guilt and shame-based social world. Why do you need that? What's so great about that? It's not, not, uh, not attractive, it's not functional, it's not pleasant. Um, why would you do that? So it just results in distortion and disempowerment of the soul. So reactions to that stress and trauma take the form of various addictions. And these are also classified as vices by the religious moral people who caused them in the first place. You know, a lot of people um, have addictions which they acquired either in actual wartime or growing up in a dysfunctional family which is comparable to being in a war zone. And that is where it comes from. So it doesn't come from the person themselves. It comes from when the person is spiritually depleted, they cannot handle the negativity that is directed at them from childhood, uh, from the social, political, religious, educational, business, corporate world. And Shri Baba seems to me to be saying, ooh, you know, you need some power because then you'll be able to handle all this stuff and um, you'll be fine. So I think I will stop there and turn it over to Wanji uh, and see um, what kind of a discussion we need to have about all this part. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sister Denise. Uh, before we go further, it would be perhaps useful for us to pause and um, have a few moments of silence. So I think in this silence, just go deep into the cell to be aware that I, the soul, who has had so many births, 84 births. The level of my spiritual energy is low. Even though I've been doing Raj Yoga for a long time, 
the level is still insufficient. It's not bad. It's just like that. And I must be realistic that my level of spiritual power is not enough for my satisfaction. And so the most important thing I must do is look at all the different ways to let myself reach a higher level of energy, be open to Shibaba, be more easily able to shift into soul consciousness, to spend more time in that dimension of light, be unconcerned about any negative emotions that may be um, pulsing through my being. To know that the more yoga I do, the more negative emotions will come to the surface. And I just let them pass out of my system. That leaves me free, light, and easy inside. Shanti. <sighs> um, <clears throat> one of the thoughts that comes, um, I don't know if others can relate to it, but perhaps it's useful. Sister Denise, do what why? So my question is, why would uh, authorities, whether they are uh, the religious authorities, the parents, educate authorities, and education, etc. Where are they coming from when they become so authoritarian, subject people to this horrible experience? What do they get out of it? Perhaps it's useful to clarify that. It seems to me that it's a combination of belief and tradition and um, continuing to do to others what was done to oneself. It's a very, very strong energy in a lot of people. And if you are a traditional person in a traditional society, um, any change is a threat. Any comment about it is a, is a statement against you. And you will do anything and everything to maintain the status quo. Uh, and it, it is said in... Um, uh, therapy, different kinds of therapy, that people generally prefer the hell they know to the heaven they don't know. Because, you know, going into something new is really stressful. And um, it is the case that something has to be so bad that changing is less bad than that. But until it's less bad, <laughs> it will stay in that. And you see, in a 
religious context, uh, there is such a very strong um, pressure to maintain the traditions that if you do anything different, you're immediately a heretic and you will immediately be crucified, which is what happened to Jesus, who was a perfectly fine Jew until he said things which they all knew were true, but they didn't like it, so they got rid of him. And this is normal, you see. What does uh, someone do who is involved in innovation, who is visionary, who sees where the future is and things like that? You may choose to stick your neck out, but if you stick your neck out, someone will chop you. So it's a risk. But then, you know, if you don't do it, then who will do it? It's like that. So this is why one has to be very um, easy about the fact that to... Um, to move forward requires great patience. And this is something we see in Sheep Baba. He talks to people every single day, telling them the same thing, which they forget within seconds. Mm -hmm. And then he tells it again and again. And then a few people pick it up, but very, very few. And so he has to um, feed them with the information they need and then there's new people coming in, so he has to go back to the beginning every day. And um, it's, a, it's a really um, brilliant um, template, I would say. You know, he, he keeps on saying all these incredibly uh, uh, heretical things uh, <laughs> in a quiet <laughs> voice. And uh, he reminds you of, you know, that you have been remembering him and wanting him to come and wanting the knowledge and wanting to be pure and wanting to be free. So here it is. And then, uh, then they don't like it. And he knows that. And so anybody who wants to move this forward and needs to remember that it, it takes time takes a lot of repetition, you have to demonstrate it, um, you have to put it out into the vibrations, all these things. And uh, another thing that happens is that um, change is anyway going on in the atmosphere. This is the period of change, the confluence age is where there's a rapid change in technology that we can all see is very difficult to keep up with it all. And the, the climate change is really upsetting everybody because they are scared of it and they can't control it, can't do anything about it. Um, the economic uh, circumstances are getting very dire for many people. Um, and that the people who are holding the tradition, they become old and they die. And then the new uh, youth uh, also has this energy of um, adventure and uh, looking at something new and so on. So change does happen. And we are in this period of time of evolution, which Baba calls the confluence age, where the Iron Age is turning into the Golden Age, uh, which is a high-tech place and also a highly spiritual place, which means the spirituality <laughs> needs to develop at the speed of technology. And so I think that's kind of interesting um, comparison to make. And I think what he also reminds us every day in the Murali, which he did also today in the Murali, why are you worried, you know, this is my responsibility all you have to do is uh, tell people what I'm telling you, do the practice, get on with it, and uh, I will make sure everything is okay. So don't worry about anything. And I think that is um, pretty good. At this point, Sister Denise, I, there are a few questions that are coming up in relation to a Murli a few days, two days ago, where Baba said, <clears throat> 
anger causes a great deal of sorrow. If I have my thought that I dislike someone or I ignore someone, is this a bias? Well, put it this way, you're talking about how you conduct yourself in uh, human relationships. If you uh, express um, negative feelings, um, you want a person to feel your negativity, you want to express that, um, that's going to hurt their feelings. And uh, then you may just do it in a very subtle way by, by how you look at them. Um, if you ignore people, that's really not good. But you see, suppose you have like thousands of people in your contact, it's not possible for you to give enough attention to every single one of those because your amount of attention has to be divided into a thousand pieces and it will not satisfy anyone they they cannot fulfill the expectations of everyone uh, but they limit their engagement to people who are really important to them and chief baba says look you really um uh, cannot give all your attention and put out all your energy to all these people because you are just going to get more depleted by that. And they may not like it uh, because they want to feed on your energy. And then if you don't let them, they think that you're behaving badly, but actually you're not behaving badly. You have a right to not let yourself be um, consumed by other people's hunger, you see, that, that's um, your right. And it's actually not okay to allow people to do that, but they don't like that. So they consider it as a vice and blame you for not letting them eat you. <laughs> but, you know. Um, and this is this is just because people equate um, getting satisfaction with good action, because they do not think that they should not prey upon other people because they're hungry. And Baba says, "Look, if you're hungry." take from me, don't take from each other because you're just going to get into karmic accounts and things are going to go bad, you see. So it's the fact that um, people's perception of what's right and wrong is actually quite far away from what's actually right and wrong. So when, therefore, Baba says, have all relationships with me that fills all my relational needs and then does that mean it's therefore easier for me to relationship means you want something people don't get that but relation you have a relationship with somebody because you want something from them and so it's kind of transactional um people want everything for free. So they want your love. They don't want to give anything back. They want this from you. They don't want to give anything back. So they change what they want into a duty or an obligation. You have an obligation to satisfy me to an unlimited extent. And if you don't, you're a bad person. That's totally untrue. And so the society is filled with these incorrect beliefs which are too complicated to sort out and you end up getting completely emptied and exhausted or you become a predator yourself and put everybody into your debt so you're in karmic bondage either way so she baba says the best way to break this situation is for you individually to take all your needs from Sheep Baba because he's unlimited. 
you won't love take it from Shiv Baba because he doesn't need anything from you. He's already full to overflowing. He's not going to get diminished by what you take. But you try and take from anyone else, they will make you pay. And uh, you will not get fulfilled. And all the propaganda about relationships is um, not really to be trusted. So, so he gives us this, you know, you, you um, need company, you need to feel loved, you need to feel important, validated, all these various things that you need because you're spiritually depleted get that fulfillment from him because then in your relationship with other people uh, you will not be trying to get something from them and you will not be open for them to try to uh, grab you into their vortex so that they can start to devour you um, <laughs> And uh, this is the time when everybody, everybody is really depleted. Could it be that we take sorrow and harm because of the desire of wanting to belong? Um, sure. Why do you want to belong? What is this? You already belong. You know, you are Sheep Baba's child. You belong to Sheep Baba. And... Um, you know, belonging is a little bit close to slavery. <laughs> so if you belong to somebody, you become their slave and they can do what they want with you. So I, I don't think that's very attractive to me. I, I don't want to be anybody's slave. I, I like my freedom. Um, but, you know, I my relationship with Sheep Baba is I belong to him because there's not going to be anything that he is going to take from me that's going to diminish me. Do you see what I mean? So if everybody is in that very good relationship with God, but then people are not going to be devouring each other. Uh, there's another question, sister. Uh, the Bosi authoritarian BK teachers, are they acting in this way because they act from their wounds or because they are less quality souls? You may experience that there is a person in the position of teacher who you perceive to be in this particular way. Um, but what Baba says is this is a circumstance, it's a scene in drama. And your experience of that person is personal to you. You're experiencing them that way. And you need to interpret the scene, interpret this relationship, um, because it's telling you something about you. You see, in Raj Yoga, there's one very important statement, which Daddy Jenki used to remind us about a lot. Um, Ishwar Chintan and Swachintan. Think about yourself and think about God. If you think about others, you get misled. So think about yourself and think about God. Okay, there's God. You have a relationship with God. He fulfills you. You have your morally and everything. And you're in relationship with a human being who is thinking of themselves in a particular way and behaving in a particular way. And you have to deal with that. So this is all about your yoga, which is to be interpreted as skill in action. So if somebody is disturbing you in one way or another, there's something about how you are handling it that's allowing you to be disturbed. So whether the person is disturbing you or not or behaving well or badly is neither here nor there. It doesn't really matter. What matters is how you perceive it, how you take it, what you do with it, and how you um, use this as a lesson uh, to understand something about yourself that you haven't quite understood. 
very important reminder. So rather than go into the psychology of why is she, I ask myself why. Why is she? Because it's in the drama. That's why. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, corrupted aspects of the soul erupt and give the impression of distress and negativity. This is to be ensured. It means only that it is living in nothing else. This is in the last part of the of the material. Okay. So the question mm. is, how do I know that it is leaving me and not recurring? You know, because um, that's the definition of the eruption of corrupted stuff. It's erupting because it's leaving. If it wasn't erupting, it's still with you. But if you can't handle it, then you will try to suppress it and put it back inside. And then it'll have to erupt again a bit worse later. So you might as well let it erupt and let it out. Um, all of the apparently bad things that happen to you now are a little bit at a time so that you acquire some skills at handling these things. And then when it all comes all at once, um, then, then you are experienced to be able to do it. All the different things that happen to you along the way, just remember you're a spiritual warrior in training and that um, all these things are supposed to happen because you need to get strong and you need to get experienced. And that's why it's happening. Testing. The thing about um, power is it corrupts and people desire power and when they get power it's very difficult to not be poisoned by it so you have to be very pure and very clean and how many people are very pure and very clean you can't expect to find very many and so you know, when you when you encounter someone who is, you're encountering somebody really rare. And then if you think that something really rare should be something totally general, then you've got your maths mixed up. You can't expect everyone to be perfect. <laughs> if you encounter someone who is really very, very good, that, that's most unusual. So enjoy it, appreciate it, but don't assume that everybody will be like that. Uh, but rather use the circumstances of another person's getting impacted by being in a position of power to abuse their authority. This is normal human behavior. Uh, there are four uh, words. Fight, flight, freeze, and another one which is fawn. And fawning means like being super, super nice to get the person to not be threatening. That's another, you know, reaction that people do. And they, these are all psychological um, therapeutic vocabularies. And... Um, Raj Yoga is not really about that, although, you know, you, you really do need to um, be in your power. So when you're reacting, fight, flight, uh, warning or freezing, you're disempowered. And so in Raj Yoga, you will notice different behaviors that indicate that you're disempowered and then you kind of go back to the drawing board of um, focusing your attention on becoming soul conscious taking power from Shiv Baba and putting yourself into all these different circumstances and observing how you are improving how you are handling your um, feelings and um, getting free, it's a long, slow process.
And uh, so we're in this for the long haul. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, some of the explanations that um, you are presenting to us to try and understand and therefore work on really the self are similar to psychological therapy. Now, people keep bringing up psychological therapeutic things because this is very much happening at the moment. And um, there is a, a spectrum, you can say, psychological to spiritual. And the word psyche means the soul and logos means to know. So psychology is to know about the soul without using the word soul. And spirituality is to know about the soul using the word soul. <laughs> you know, and um, some people say, uh, if you are being psychological, then you shouldn't be because you're supposed to be spiritual. And if you're um, spiritual and you look at psychological things, you shouldn't be because that's not spiritual. You know, people don't kind of understand that these are ways of trying to figure out who you are. And the um, scientific medical angle doesn't use religious words and vice versa. So they've created an artificial divide. Thank you for that. But there are lots of things that um, Baba talks about that the psychologists also talk about, you know, and um, making an artificial distinction is... Um, making a big deal out of something that doesn't exist, I think. Because you're talking about the same thing using different vocabulary. Um, it's like a, a political thing, really. Um, in a democracy, they say you have to separate church and state. So the state deals with psychology and the church deals with religion. And if they tread on each other's territory, that's somehow bad. You know, any time if you remove something toxic from the body or the soul or the heart or whatever, it's painful. But if you don't remove it, it's more painful. So it's just... Um, there's no free lunch, put it that way. If you want to be free, you have to pay the price. And if you want to stay in prison, that's a higher price. So be economically savvy. The session for yesterday and today have been very enriching. Uh, and um, we super appreciate these opportunities mm -hmm. that the EGY is exploring and continuing to explore. So um, we are ending in a few minutes. So may we request Sister Denise to lead us again to a meditation experience in silence. Thank you, Vanji. Om Shanti. So in conclusion, let all the petals and papers that are whirling around in your mind, let them settle down and um, be in a free space inside. And come to the essence of who you are. A pure being of light with a complicated part in drama. And 
let your parting drama sit quiet and just be a point of light in the vast world of light. Aware of the ocean of light. Open to receive that energy and strength. And move forward with your eye on the destination.